Great. Why don't we get started um, uh, with this panel? I'm Brent McIntosh. I'm an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, and uh, previously was at the, the Treasury Department, uh, both as Undersecretary for International Affairs and as General Counsel. We have a terrific panel today on uh, the <clears throat> excuse me, on where we might be headed, the, the various uh, antitrust bills pending on the Hill and their marketplace implications. And we have a, a truly expert uh, set of speakers to address that. Um, from, from the far left, uh, Mark Whitener, who is an adjunct professor at Georgetown's McDonough School of Business and a senior fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Mark has spent 35 years practicing antitrust law, including including at GE, uh, and he served at the FTC as Deputy Director of the Bureau of Competition. And then Darren Baxt, who's a Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, prolific on a variety of public policy topics uh, in the regulatory space, previously also uh, with the Chamber of Commerce. And then Maureen Olhausen, who's a partner at Baker Botts, formerly the acting chair and a commissioner at the FTC, before becoming uh, co a commissioner, led the FTC's Internet Access Task Force. Um, we're going to have each of, our, uh, of uh, those up on stage speak for a few minutes. I have some questions, and then we will open it for audience questions. So have your questions ready. Um, I'm going to, without uh, further ado, turn it over to Mark for his comments. Okay. Thank you. Our topic, I guess, is antitrust policy and legislation. Um, I guess I begin by saying that the, the antitrust debate is unfortunately becoming ideological again. A, a brief history. The early antitrust populism expressed most notably in Louis Brandeis's Curse of Bigness was really only supplanted, durably supplanted, by the ascendancy of the economics movement. And while I think it'd be inaccurate to say that that movement was entirely non-ideological, that it didn't contain any normative sort of economic ideology in some of its origins, that movement, the economics movement, really became fundamentally about positive economic analysis. And so for several decades we've had, we've been in almost, I hesitate to say, a, a golden era of reasonably objective, reasonably non-political, um, rigorous analytical approach to antitrust issues. But now we're seeing a resurgence of ideology, literally in the curse of bigness, Redux, Tim Wu's 2018 version in his book. So why is this happening? I think there are a couple of reasons. To some extent, the antitrust policy debate is starting just to resemble other dysfunctional policy debates in this country. Immigration, climate policy, voting rights where ideology and partisan divides are crowding out evidence-based analysis. And so I think some of the would-be antitrust revolutionaries certainly are ideologues in this sense, driven by the urge to take down big business or remake the economy in what they see as a more egalitarian image. But also, to some extent, I think the antitrust turmoil reflects something else. And I, I'll just call it political opportunism, for lack of a better term. Driven more by anti-big tech populism than by any real ideology. And the fact that some of the most extreme ideas in antitrust reform today are coming from opposite ends of the political spectrum, Elizabeth Warren and Josh Hawley, I think is an indication of this. Now, I'm not too interested in ideology, particularly when it comes to antitrust. You know, Brandeis versus Bork is not a useful or even relevant debate today. Brandeis never articulated a workable or a constructive approach, in my view, to thinking about antitrust, nor do Robert Bork's views today represent the way antitrust is applied in every respect. It was seminal in prompting and bringing about the economics movement. That movement, movement has evolved. So I think the current movement seeking antitrust reform, or really even revolution, is gaining traction. And so I think we need to refocus the antitrust debate on more rational analytical grounds, the same grounds that we should be focusing on in any policy formation area. Start with a clear-eyed assessment of current policy. What are its goals and motivating principles? How is it working in practice based on empirical analysis? If it's working reasonably well, then basically leave it alone. Or 
at a minimum, avoid legislation and allow the antitrust agencies and the courts to continue doing what they've done for the last several decades, which is apply antitrust flexibly to evolving facts and theories. Let's call that option one. Basically, things are working, leave them alone and allow continued, if you will, evolution by those who are implementing the law. Now, if the goals and principles are solid after a, a, a real assessment, but the assessment's shown that there are some deficiencies in how they're applied or implemented, well, then propose alternatives and subject the alternatives to the same analysis you subject the original policy to. This is the purported, I'll call this the middle ground or option two approach, which is contained in a number of legislative proposals. Now, I'm not going to walk through all, I couldn't possibly walk through all of the legislative proposals, either actually proposed in Congress or suggested by think tanks or others. But, but this middle ground could be captured, I think, perhaps best by referring to Senator Klobuchar's proposals, some of them captured in the Senate Calera bill. Now, I say this is the purported middle ground because some of the proposals that are being made in this category are actually more radical than they appear. But at least they acknowledge that fundamental elements of current antitrust doctrine, doctrine should be remained you know, kept in place. And Maureen has written on this subject and has laid out a very helpful taxonomy and discussion of these proposals and put them into, I'll, I'll, I'll claim, somewhat you know, similar categories. Now, the third approach is to challenge the whole thing. Um, blow, scrap it, blow it up, and start over. And this is, um, I would say, a serious... Um, accurate description of some of the more radical proposals. So option three um, starts over, supplements or replaces the current framework with a range of proposals, but many of which resort to essentially categorical prescriptions of certain types of transactions, sizes of transactions, and types of business conduct. Or if it doesn't outright pro prohibit them, it puts very strong uh, limits on business activity. Well, here you need a cost-benefit analysis of starting from not only is the current approach working or not, or how well is it working, to what are the proposed alternatives. Whatever else we might say about blowing up the current system and starting over, one thing that has to be said is there has not been any serious cost-benefit analysis of any of the alternatives. And if they're going to be taken seriously, that has to happen. And maybe today we'll start talking a little bit about some of the consequences of some of these things if they were ever actually to become law. Now, obviously, the policy world, the real world we live in, doesn't typically work in this nice, linear, analytical, fact-based uh, approach to policy formation. <clears throat> but here the point I would make, and I don't know who in the room are antitrust people or have worked in antitrust, and I have, and so obviously, you know, one tends to usually prefer the group we've come from, the antitrust world has typically been populated by some pretty smart analytical people. And the agencies, for better or worse, have tended to perform well, have tended to apply a fairly transparent um, analysis to their cases, and that analysis tends to hold up reasonably well when it's examined in retrospect. So. Antitrust can and should do better than some of these other policy areas where we have, you know, dysfunction and cacophony. The evidence so far does not satisfy even the first condition of blowing up the current system and certainly doesn't justify any of the proposals. Now, the last thing I want to just talk to for a minute, in addition to the ideological approach to antitrust, which doesn't really invite empirical response, okay? There are those who are urging a reform of antitrust who are making fact-based arguments. And I would say the, argu the central argument sort of collapses to this. Competition is declining in the United States uh, as, a as a result in part of increasing concentration in various markets. And this is due in large part to lax and declining antitrust enforcement. So if we look at each of those elements, first, is competition declining? It's a rich economic debate. It's still ongoing. It can be studied. It is being studied. But I would just say, I'd put to you that claims that the U.S. economy is becoming more concentrated in a meaningful antitrust sense and less competitive at the expense of consumers has been sharply disputed 
and that literature is out there and it's still being added to. Second, whether we believe that competition has declined or not, has there been declining antitrust enforcement? And here I would point to two papers that I and my colleagues at Georgetown have put out in the last year or two. One showing that in, if you look at a time period that basically covers all what I'll call the Chicago school period, and also happens to essentially cover the period in which mergers and acquisitions were subjected to this Hart Scott Rodino filing framework. So since roughly the late 1970s, antitrust enforcement against mergers has increased. In fact, it's nearly doubled as a proportion to the number of deals filed. And second, that when those cases go to court, the government has been more likely to succeed over time, not less. One little corollary to that, when we look at the court outcomes, which some have said have been driven by ideology of judges and judicial appointments, we find no correlation in the outcomes of litigated merger cases according to the party of the president who appointed the deciding judge. And if you step outside mergers, which are relatively easy to analyze because you've got good data, looking at business conduct cases, it's more complicated. And undeniably, there have been changes in the law that have made antitrust more rigorous and in some cases less amenable to enforcement against some kinds of business conduct. But I would just say that first, those changes have been based on a fairly rigorous, consistent, transparent doctrine, which you can look at and discuss and, and agree or disagree on. And secondly, that I think most objective analysts, if they looked at the actual practices that previously were condemned and now are either allowed or viewed up more objectively, in many cases, various types of vertical restraints, per se rules against various types of conduct, I think an objective analysis would say that the changes were for the good. So antitrust is broad, it's powerful, it's potent, it's serious, we need to take it seriously. And I think we need to go back to the fundamentals of good policy formation and try to apply those in antitrust, even if we don't really see them being applied very often in other policy areas. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, Darren. Thank you. Um, it's my first in-person appearance since the start of the pandemic. Uh, so it's great to see people. And but any time my head kind of just freezes, and I just look like I'm staring at one place. It's, the Zoom stuff, presentation, so bear with me. Um, you know, it's interesting is when you're doing the Zoom presentations, you're you know, normally it's just a look up and when you're presenting, but during Zoom, when you start looking up, it looks like you're staring at the ceiling. So hopefully I'm not going to just be like staring at one person, like freaking them out. Um, so, so I want to make three points regarding the current policy environment, regarding antitrust. First, I want to get straight to the elephant in the room for conservatives and many others. And that's that conservatives have a valid reason to be angry with some big tech companies, and it arises from speech restriction. And because of these concerns, some conservatives are looking to federal policy solutions, and I understand this desire. If there's to be a policy solution, though, it's important to be a, you have to have a narrow solution to properly and directly address a public policy problem, kind of mirroring what, what Mark was saying. Um, antitrust doesn't meet that requirement. Antitrust is a specific tool that has nothing to do with addressing non-competition issues like bias and censorship. Applying antitrust to speech concerns is like trying to s squeeze a, scare, a square peg into a round hole. It's not going to solve the problems, and it could give the far left its most powerful weapon to radically change the American economic system. So justified anger towards big tech shouldn't lead conservatives to lose sight of their principles and to weaponize antitrust to go after disfavored industries. The, the left has plenty of targets that they would go after if it became kind of the thing to do with antitrust. Second, let's talk about how the far left would welcome the, we the weaponization of antitrust. And when I talk about weaponization, I'm not just talking about going after disfavored industries. I'm talking about amending existing antitrust legislation or implementing antitrust in a way to make it much easier to use antitrust and actually for almost any purpose they want. They would welcome conservatives falling for what I think is basically a Trojan horse. I think this is a trap. 
There are obviously some who want to move away from the consumer welfare standard so that the, the antitrust is very subjective and arbitrary and it's a tool for the government to not only address alleged economic issues, but to address non-economic issues, including things that have absolutely nothing to do with the economy. So am I overstating my case? Well, unfortunately, I don't think so. There's already proposed legislation out there that would force companies to divest businesses and punish economic success and block certain businesses from being able to grow. The House Democratic Antitrust Report from last year, co-authored by the new FTC Chair Lena Khan, recommends amending existing antitrust law to make it far more difficult for companies across the economy, not just tech, to merge or acquire other firms. And then there's proposed legislation to make that happen. And the FTC recently rescinded a bipartisan framework from 2015 that it developed during the Obama administration, which in part supported the consumer welfare focus of antitrust law. And then we, we can look at other areas to get a glimpse of what could be on the horizon. So there's many on the left that are turn, basically trying to turn every policy issue into an issue or a means to address climate change. And that provides a sneak peek of how antitrust could be used to do the same exact thing and address issues, again, not relating to competition. For example, some are pushing regulation as a way to address environmental, social, and governmental objectives. The use of antitrust would give, I believe, the far left an incredible, probably their biggest weapon to achieve those objectives and other objectives. And it wouldn't be a stretch to envision this because the far left, to, to see the far left trying to break up companies, for example, because companies are investing in fossil fuels. After all, environmental pressure groups have already pushed Treasury Secretary Jan Janet Yellen to take drastic action to fight climate change, such as by forcing oil and gas companies to sell off fossil fuel assets. Third, antitrust is a narrow tool with very powerful remedies to address anti-competitive conduct, and therefore should be used very carefully, not willy-nilly. But conservatives and libertarians are rightfully concerned with heavy-handed regulation from the federal bureaucrats. Therefore, imagine giving federal agencies the power of antitrust. It would make the, even the most extreme regulatory scheme look tame by comparison. Instead of ex expanding antitrust, conservatives should ensure that existing antitrust is used appropriately and judiciously, again, to address a specific and genuine public policy problem. Look, the, the, the principle of using antitrust judiciously doesn't mean that antitrust should never be applied, but it does mean not weaponizing it. So, so closing out, here's the closing takeaways. The threat of weaponized antitrust should be a critical concern. So, I mean, we're here, there's a reason why we're here, there's a lot of people paying attention to this issue, and it's something that we should definitely have on our radar screen. I think it's a real threat. Policymakers shouldn't punish economic success and innovation. They shouldn't confuse protecting competitors with protecting the competitive process. And they shouldn't assume that the federal government somehow has a magic ability to centrally plan the economy or that big is bad. They shouldn't assume that putting more power in the hands of government is going to help promote more speech. It, it won't. It actually will likely chill speech. And we should cer certainly not want the government um, in involved with speech. We don't want them to be the speech police. And it won't help with competition. It would actually probably make it less competitive and reduce innovation. And really important for a lot of conservatives out there, weaponized antitrust is not limited to big tech. It affects the entire economy. What would happen by gutting the consumer welfare standard and changing antitrust is you'd be giving federal agencies incredible discretionary power. And as I speak here today, we have a country with some very disturbing vaccine uh, mandates, um, really some serious attacks on private property rights. An administration that is going on what I call the build bureaucracy bigger campaign. So we shouldn't need all these real scary life examples to know that giving the federal government almost unfettered power isn't a good idea. So, so what should be done? Again, I said antitrust should be used appropriately, and I think antitrust as it is now is well suited to address new challenges.
If there is a genuine, a genuine concern regarding competition, this is an incredible opportunity to go on offense. Policymakers should be focusing on how government itself hinders competition and innovation. Get rid of the barrage of unnecessary regulations and laws like occupational licensing laws that make it difficult for Americans to even achieve their, you know, their, their career path. And policymakers should be going after cronyism and corporate welfare. And I know that's kind of an uphill battle. Obviously, too many firms go to Congress expecting policymakers to give them some type of advantage that they haven't, out, that they haven't earned because they're being outcompeted by other firms. Um, if you change, if you, if you, if special interests know the antitrust and weaponized antitrust is something that policymakers will use, that will definitely turn cronyism, make it even far worse than it already is. So the, the U.S. is an economic model for the world because of its free enterprise system, economic freedom, and the innovation of the American people, not central planning of D.C. And I just would suggest we can't forget those principles or what makes this country great. I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Darren, and uh, now Maureen. Great. Th thank you. Del delighted to be here. Um, so I really appreciate the two preceding speakers laying the groundwork for a good discussion of the future of antitrust and where things might be going. Um, I'm by nature an optimist, so I will mention one bright spot that I saw in some of this, uh, which I really appreciate, uh, and Darren, you mentioned it, occupational licensing reform. Uh, that is actually something um, that uh, the Obama administration had a very good report on that at the end of the Obama administration. It's something um, at the FTC, uh, going back to the Bush administration, we had uh, focused on, and when I was the acting chairman, I had a task force, an economic liberty task force to focus on this, and I was quite pleased to see it continued in the recent executive order on, on competition. So if we're forecasting the future, let's hope that occupational licensing reform continues to be one of the um, things that achieves bipartisan support. But uh, turning maybe to a little more of the um, <laughs> the near term, um, one of the things that uh, I foresee happening is that there is this sense of frustration that the people who want to use antitrust to do more things, to uh, reduce bigness of companies, to reduce their, um, their power overall, unrelated from consumer welfare effects, um, that um, they... Uh, are frustrated with the way the courts have interpreted the current antitrust laws, right? They don't, they don't like certain outcomes in merger cases or in conduct cases. Um, and so some of the legislative proposals would address that, right? The idea that we, we don't like this standard, so we're gonna undo it by legislation. But we all know legislation is hard, we all know that um, it is a long and winding path, and I completely agree with, um, with Darren that uh, it's one thing when you say, well, it's only going to impact you know, four or five companies, uh, and it's another thing when people begin to wake up to the, uh, to the wider economic, wider you know, economy-wide impacts, and we might start to see some you know, political pushback um, more broadly. So, so given that state of affairs, one thing that I think the FTC, the current leadership, is very uh, determined to go forward with is something that doesn't require Congress to act in their mind. That is a way to do an end run around unfavorable court decisions that they, they don't care for. And the current chair of the FTC, Lena Khan, with current commissioner, um, Rohit Chopra had done an article uh, about saying that uh, focusing on the FTC's long dormant, if truly almost never exercised, unfair methods of competition rulemaking authority. Um, and so they are putting in place the apparatus, the, 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 the staff, and kind of clearing the decks policy-wise to be able to move forward to try to make what are essentially antitrust rules that are not um, cabined by unfavorable Sherman Act or Clayton Act precedent. 
So turning to, so it's unfair methods of competition rulemaking. <laughs> so turning to the unfair methods of competition part of it first, the rescission of the previous unfair methods of competition policy statement, which tethered the interpretation of unfair methods of competition to uh, the consumer welfare standard, uh, they rescinded that. Right, so that certainly suggests that they are going to try to have a, a broader view. So when you go back to the reason why the FTC was created, one of the concerns at the time, so the FTC was created in 19, I think, 14? I think it came into existence in 1914, right? So a lot of legislation was in 1913, was the idea that the, the Sherman Act, which was already in existence, had been interpreted by the courts to be very, very narrow, extremely narrow interpretation. And so there was this legislative language history talking about, well, we want unfair methods of competition to be broader than that. And we want to have an expert body, the FTC, that on a case by case approach gives guidance to business about what the rules of the road for competition should be. So using that idea that, well, unfair methods of competition is supposed to be broader than the Sherman Act, the current leadership seems to have the idea that, uh, well, then it can be used as a tool to reach conduct that isn't a violation of the Sherman Act. Now, what they haven't contended with is, over the years, the Sherman Act has been greatly expanded uh, through court interpretation. So at what point does the ever expanding boundary of unfair methods of competition, right? Is it always going to be, no matter how big the Sherman Act gets, unfair methods of competition is going to be a little broader than that? Or was it you know, going back to this very cramped view that now they should be the same? And really, up till now, uh, the FTC has generally said they are coterminous. If something is a Sherman Act violation, it's a violation of the FTC Act. And there has been this kind of flirtation with this idea that, well, unfair methods of competition has, you know, it's not like this, right? It's not Sherman Act, um, FTC Act, it's like this, right? There's a lot of overlap, but there's some penumbral unfair methods of competition. And the FTC has spectacularly lost that argument numerous times in court. Uh, but, but yet, they'll, try, they'll probably try once again. So that's the unfair methods of competition part of it. But the rulemaking part of it is really interesting because the FTC has essentially promulgated one complete unfair methods of competition rule. It had to do with the very, very important issue of tailored men's and boys' clothing. Uh, it was never enforced. Uh, but there was a, a rule that the FTC did uh, where they did a combined unfair methods of competition and consumer protection rule, because the FTC also has consumer protection authority. And the D.C. Circuit at the time, which was kind of in the full flood of, you know, embracing rulemaking, said that the FTC, you know, did have this authority. It's not really in the statute. It's sort of a in a um, like a sort of sidebar of the of the statute, but they the court said, well, the statute didn't say that they don't have it. Congress didn't say they don't have it. Rulemaking is a good thing. Ergo, they have this authority. So Congress steps in and acts and passes something called the Magnuson Moss Act that focuses on the FTC's consumer protection authority and says, well, they have consumer protection authority, but they have to have all these extra. Um, protections in place. Notice and comment rulemaking, uh, APA rulemaking is not enough. They need all these other kind of bells and whistles on it to make sure that it, you know, is there's public input and there's not bias and, you know, lots and lots of um, guardrails there. And then the FTC, you know, went forward and made some rules under that. It never, th after that, tried to make an unfair methods of competition rule until today. And so now the current leadership believes that they have this streamlined APA rulemaking authority notice and comment, and that they can use this tool to, to um, I, I believe, kind of get over the hurdle of having to get Congress to authorize that, uh, the challenges of that, and as a way to um, sort of sidestep unfavorable um, case law.
So that raises a lot of really interesting issues, a lot of constitutional issues. There's been a lot of interpretation, uh, statutory interpretation um, since that D.C. Circuit opinion in the, it was called the Petroleum Refiners case. Um, and so it's very interesting to see what will come of that. But they, they seem very um, enthusiastic about moving ahead. So even if things get hung up in Congress and even if the courts continue to kind of have a strict interpretation of the antitrust laws, I think the FTC believes it has this newly revealed third path that for 100 years somehow the FTC didn't notice or act on. Uh, but now this is going to lead them into the, the future of an interpretation of unfair methods competition that could be quite expansive. Great, Thank, thanks for those comments. Let me, um, as a first question, uh, ask you all to explore one, one point that I think was presupposed by, by Darren's comments, which is uh, issues about the political valence uh, here uh, and, and the idea that this is a sort of conservative liberal um, uh, divide in, in the in the policy space because calls for major antitrust legislation are are coming from both left and right uh, and I wonder if you could talk about um, the extent to which those are because of shared viewpoints whether on the current concerns that they're trying to vindicate or the policies they're trying to propose is this fundamentally about uh, grounded in a sort of economic populism, or, or what is the what is the uh, the reason for the fact that there seems to be an alignment of left and right uh, on some of these issues? I can go ahead and some on. Okay, I should clarify that that there definitely are some people on the right. Um, that would actually weaponize antitrust, which is kind of the big concern that I would have. I think when you saw that the, so the House um, Judiciary Committee had a package of bills and they it got through the Judiciary Committee. But for the most part, it was, it was the Democrats supporting that legislation. There were a few Republicans. So I wouldn't say it's kind of equal bipartisan support for weaponizing antitrust, but it, I don't want to make it sound like it's only a left right issue. There is some common ground when it comes to the left and right, especially as it relates to big tech and trying to reform a law called 230, which we don't need to get into, but there is a concern regarding speech um, issues. The problem is that the people on the left, folks on the left, have a completely different view on the speech issues as those particularly concerned about speech issues on the right. Whereas people, the conservatives, are concerned about the chilling of speech by certain tech companies, company uh, folks on the left are concerned that they're not doing enough. So I think there's some common ground and some just general dislike of tech that's definitely motivating this. And a lot of the legislation that is out there connected to antitrust is tech focused. Now I think it's important not to just think that it's just a tech issue and this will go away and it'll just be this little carve out of antitrust dealing with tech. I think that even the tech specific laws are a template for using weaponized antitrust for other industries. And of course, there are other broader legislative, um, proposed legislation like the Klobuchar bill that's out there as well. Yeah, I, as I think I said at the beginning, I think there are a couple of different um, strains to this reform movement. And one of them pretty clearly is ideologically driven from the left. Um, I think there are some conservatives who have bought into elements of the big is bad, but I think that's fundamentally a pro-regulatory, um, anti-business um, doctrinal approach. Uh, and the other one I guess I tend to think of as more generally populist, and the thing about populism is it, it will welcome all, all uh, adherents. It depends on which people you're pandering to, so you can put a lot of things into that populist bucket. Without both of those movements, I don't think we'd be here today thinking or worrying too much about the po prospect for legislative reform. And even, even with both movements, I wouldn't put my money on any major reforms being enacted, frankly. But the two of them together, I think, are what's driving this, this moment. Um, one of the problems or for those who want radical reform is, though, I think they'll have an extremely hard time coming up with a consensus on what to do about it, precisely because of the very different 
interests and strains and, and viewpoints that are driving this, this collective urge to throw. Throwing aside what's there now, you could probably get a pretty big group for on the Hill, but replacing it with something in particular, I think is it gonna be a pretty big lift. To add one more thing to those you know, very insightful comments, so I also think you need to look at the who's traditional business model did these tech companies upset, right? So one of the things that, you know, we've really seen is this movement from traditional media, right? So traditional media was supported by advertising, right? The newspaper, you had all the ads in it, the local news, all the ads in it. And so much of that, really starting with Craigslist, where um, it kind of replaced the, you know, the sort of classified ads in newspapers, there's been this erosion of the support for the business model for traditional media. And the beneficiaries of that um, have been often these, these tech companies. So it's no surprise if you were, no one, you people recall this, the first hearing before the House Judiciary Committee subcommittee with Mr. Cicilline was on an antitrust exemption for media for traditional media to uh, bargain or negotiate collectively with tech companies. So it's, it's a little ironic and I think revealing that hearings that were all about how there's not enough antitrust enforcement, the first hearing was about having an exemption from antitrust enforcement. Uh, and I think, you know, so that doesn't say who's right and who's wrong, but I do think it explains why media across the traditional media across the spectrum has been really very enthusiastic about these antitrust reforms because they have been impacted, their business model has been in, impacted from these tech companies. That's a great point. Uh, okay, just to add one more point. I think it's actually even bigger than tech. I think there is a, it's, it's, not, it's also not just simply this kind of big is bad problem. There is a lot of issues that are being conflated together by a lot of people. And, by me, I gotta make sure I don't conflate the issues, is the tech chilling the speech, but there are these big companies out there that are part of, at least from a conservative perspective, cancel culture, wokeness, and you hear the terminology of woke companies and all that, and so a lot of conservatives are just getting really angry about it, and I appreciate that, but then you don't, but you, but you still have to like, take a step back identify what problem there is, is there even a public policy problem? And then if there is, then fine, then you take the most narrow solution to address that particular problem. And it, it may be government intervention, may not be. But one thing, and I, I just will keep trying to stress my remarks, and I'll continue to stress for however long I have to stress it, is that antitrust is the wrong tool to address that anger. Can, can I chime in on that one? It was, it was a great point, and I, just to add to it, Antitrust is kind of the first resort often in po policy, for policy issues where people either can't come up with a workable solution in another regulatory area or can't get a consensus for it. So a lot of the issues we hear around, let's say, big tech, sound more in privacy or speech um, or data protection. Those may, or, let's just say they may be concerns or they're certainly issues to be discussed, but the solutions for those are almost never going to sound in antitrust as it's been understood for decades. So, the, and, and in part it's because antitrust is so broad and potentially vague to the point of being stretched in any direction one wants, that that's where people go to try to, try to get redress. The other thing I just wanna say, I mean, having talked about the ideological movement as anti-big business, yeah, I, I, I want to go back and correct something. It's anti-certain, and maybe this is a point that the other panelists have made. It's anti-certain aspects of certain businesses. If you ask in any regulatory debate who wins and who loses, um, the losers would seem to be an identifiable small group of firms who are under attack for various things. Um, the winners include, however, other businesses. I mean, many of the protagonists for many of these reforms are competitors of the firms who are in the gun sites. 
So to say it's anti-business, no, it's anti-certain businesses and very much special pleading or rent seeking by others. And I guess finally, is it what I would ask, is it pro or anti-consumer? And so many of the practices that we're talking about are things in which consumers, whether of products or goods or services or speech, have, have spoken. And for better or worse, they've said, we're attracted to some of these things that you're trying to take down. That doesn't mean those things are necessarily always good or shouldn't be regulated. But I think there's too little focus on consumers as an important constituency here. And I would mention, when you read the, the bills, there's very little discussion of consumer interests in them. Well, that's, um, that is a great segue into another topic, which is um, fundamentally the question of, of who, who benefits here, qui bono. Um, and, and I think one aspect of that that we haven't talked about yet and that I think is worth talking about is what, is the, what are the international implications here? What are the implications for, uh, for U.S. businesses operating globally of the potential proposed changes here? Anyone want to talk about that? Uh, well, let me let, let me jump in on that, and maybe from a slightly different different angle, which is uh, so the U.S. antitrust agencies have spent many years across Republican Democrat administrations very consistently saying antitrust is about consumer welfare. It shouldn't be used for industrial policy. If it's going to be used for you know if there are other interests that. Um, outweigh antitrust, say, for example, like national security, you have to be clear about that, right? That that's a separate, like we have CFIUS in the U.S., right? It shouldn't be part of an, an antitrust analysis. Um, and we spent a lot of time advocating for that worldwide. And now we're stepping back from it. Now we're stepping away from that. And I think that raises very serious questions about what that means for American interests writ large go going forward. Because now, you know, antitrust agencies around the world can say, well, you know, you've talked about this value and that value and everything in, you know, in, in the kitchen sink and not just consumer welfare. We're just doing what you, what, what you do. So I, so I am concerned about that. And then one other thing that I do want to mention is in a number of the bills that were considered in the House, it allowed state -owned, foreign state-owned enterprises to, bring, to be plaintiffs. And the, the companies who would be on the other end of the lawsuit had to have this very high bar to defend against these claims by plaintiffs, such that they couldn't get things easily you know, done under a motion to dismiss. And so these companies would have had, if it enacted, broad discovery rights to get all this whether it's customer data or it's other kinds of platform data. Um, and regardless of what the liability would ultimately be found, they would have had this opportunity to do that. And I think that's very concerning. And so I'll just mention one other thing. Some people might have seen it. It was reported this morning that a number of former uh, high-level national security figures sent a letter to Congress raising serious concerns about the impact of this antitrust legislation on national security interests. So there's, there's a lot at stake here. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so, I mean, we'll get into, I think, more detail as to why um, some of the reforms will wind up hurting innovation and it's just bad policy and undermine economic freedom. But if, quite honestly, getting rid of the consumer welfare standard or this, I think what's and, and not providing, I mean, the consumer, well, I'm, I know you guys discussed this earlier today about the benefit of the consumer welfare standards, so I don't want to rehash it, but it provided a focus for antitrust, and it, it didn't, it maybe there's some subjectivity to it, and it's broad, but it's nowhere near as broad as what exists, kind of a neo-Brandeisian type of approach, where you're, you're worried about protecting competitors, not the competitive process, which is just basically cronyism. And then when you're doing that, you're completely ignoring um, consumers. You're, and it, it might, I've worked in the ag subsidy space, and the only thing that people focus on are the farmers, but they never think about consumers or taxpayers. And it's really important to kind of think about everybody. And particularly when we're dealing with antitrust, um, again, it's the process. It's making sure 
that certain companies are not bad actors, not simply because they're big, therefore we've got to go after them. Um, I think that moving away from existing antitrust policy will hurt us in the global marketplace. Um, in 2020, the U.S. was a, a global leader. We had 22 businesses um, in all, across all industries in the top 50 of uh, the Fortune Global 500 businesses. And, it, and that number goes up to 26 if you exclude state-owned enterprises. And, you know, there's this constant talk about how the U.S. needs to be a leader on the global stage, especially in technology, and, and we are. I mean, we're a leader. Just name the industry. We're a leader. I think, why do we want to kind of undermine that? And I think that there's a very significant risk that that's exactly what would happen. You know, for most of the past 30 years or so, as antitrust was spreading to Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Asia, developing world, um, U.S. law and U.S. authorities were essentially trying to hold the line on the expansion or the creep of policy toward the sort of neo-Brandeisian um, approach. And they did that relatively successfully with some, some losses. I advised a glo global company that encountered one of the big dust-ups of antitrust in terms of the European super-regulatory approach versus what the U.S. and others viewed as a more sensible policy. Well, you know, any standard analysis of regulation always asks, what are the implications for regulatory creep? If we do this, what happens either in the same regulatory area or others uh, if this approach starts to proliferate and expand? And so what I think we're seeing now is that the U.S. threatens to not be in any way sort of the touchstone for sensible policy that resists uh, aggressive or opportunistic expansion in, by China or the European Union or anyone else, and becomes really the, the leader in the other direction. And I know, and I, from experience, any time the U.S. takes a move that expands liability, expands flexibility by regulators, most other jurisdictions will very happily jump on board. And who has the most to lose if antitrust policy becomes um, even more potent for going after, in particular, large, successful U.S. firms? I think the answer is obvious. We've been talking primarily about legislation. I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask a question about President Biden's executive order on competition. Um, I know Maureen referenced earlier uh, occupational licensing reform. There are, there, there are a wide variety of provisions of that executive order. I wonder if, uh, if you could talk about what you see as the good and the bad there uh, and the, the general uh, philosophy behind it. Okay, I'll take it. Um, good occupational licensing, but even, even there, if you read the um, executive order and the fact sheet, it, even there it kind of qualifies, um, qualifies it more than it should. There's, I think, like 72, I might be wrong, 72 different little regulatory proposals. I, I've joked, it, it's really kind of like a, they did a survey of what really pisses off cu customers or the public and then just decided to throw in those things. This is the laundry list of items. Um, it basically, the underlying assumption is that the government needs to intervene to, I think, almost address customer service complaints. Um, there's a lot of efforts to dictate ordinary business practices across the economy. In airlines, shipping, they want to you know, violate property rights for railroads, and um, they, they talk about trying to make things more competitive, but then they want to bring back the net neutrality rules, which is actually anti-competitive, but actually helping existing incumbent firms. And I think what's, I mean, I could go on and on about this thing, but like the, uh, the meat process, they talk about meat processing issues. If they don't talk about how the government itself is part of the reason why there might be higher concentration in the meat processing industry. So if you want to sell meat in across state lines. You can only use a federally inspected facility. Um, a state inspected facility that meets all, that the USDA itself says meets all the federal requirements and it's equivalent, you cannot sell meat across state lines. You've created, what, what's happened in the 60s is effectively we've reduced the number of processing facilities. The government itself is sometimes 
shockingly, the cause of anti-competitive uh, actions. And then, ironically, and I, see, I think this executive order is an opportunity for conservatives, libertarians, and anybody who I think who's interested in economic freedom. And, and that is to focus on how the government itself, and I brought this up, how the government itself hinders competition and hurts innovation. And there's nothing in the Biden administration, uh, the, the EO, that talks about how there's this barrage of regulation that's going to be coming over the next few years. How is that going to impact consumers? It's going to hurt consumers. It's going to drive up prices for food and energy. And then when you drive up prices for basic needs like food and energy, that hurts the lower income households the most. And therefore, you have disproportionate impact on the poor. I don't see anything like that in the EO. So overall, I think it's not a great executive order. Um, it looks to the government for solutions for non-existent problems for the most part. And also should be looking, if we're really concerned about competition, we should be looking for how the federal government and states are actually earning competition in the first place. Maureen or Mark, do you want to? So, so let me weigh in with a nerdy point, but that I think might resonate with this audience. Um, so apart even from the substance of the executive order, I think we are entering some dangerous constitutional waters involving separation of powers, right? So you've got an independent agency, the Federal Trade Commission, up on the dais with the president who is directing the agency to do things. Now, in the executive order, it's couched, I think, very sort of cautiously as encouraging, but during the oral remarks, it was directing. Um, and so, okay, you know, maybe that's kind of, you know, persnickety. Um, but one of the things that I think is an even bigger issue is actually the non-delegation doctrine, right? So I've talked about this FTC rulemaking under this extraordinarily broad grant of authority from Congress to do unfair methods of competition. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen is certainly um, an increasing attention by the courts on separation of powers issues, on oversight issues. So the FTC, the head of the FTC and all the commissioners are not removable at will by the president. And yet they're now going to be exercising a good bit of you know, uh, executive authority. And now they're also going to be exercising a good bit of legislative authority from Congress through this, their interpretation of this broad delegation. So I think there are some, you know, the executive order it just kind of exemplifies some of the real important, I think, constitutional challenges, administrative law challenges, uh, as well as, you know, substantive antitrust challenges that, that lie ahead for the agency. I guess I agree with all the comments. <clears throat> a lot of in that executive order is directionally somewhat helpful. Some of it, most of it um, isn't. I suspect it won't have a great impact. At some point, um, perhaps the court will take more cases to try to decide or limit the creeping assertion of executive power, even leaving aside the important issue of independent agencies, but just sort of policy by executive order is something that's been, I think, increasingly a problem. But I, I, I don't think any executive order is likely to sig <clears throat> significantly move the needle, <clears throat> excuse me, on antitrust policy. Um, much of that policy is now enshrined in case law, and, it's, and so the courts are going to be driving um, um, law and policy formation unless and until there's major legislation, which as I said, I'm skeptical that we'll see. So my main concern really about what's happening today is less what the executive does in terms of orders and more what the agencies do in terms of exercising their discretion, particularly in areas like mergers where they have a lot of ability through the process to hold things up, maybe a topic we'll talk about um, separately. Well, I want to open the, I have lots more questions I could ask, but I do want to open the floor to questions from the floor. So um, any questions pending? Well, I'm happy to, oh, please, sir. Oh, I'm just kind of 
Uh, hi, Maureen. Just a quick follow-up on, on your non-delegation point. Um, one of the fascinating things that's gone on during the Biden administration is that they're using the old CFPB case as an excuse that he can now fire um, uh, uh, people that are on board. So you just fired all the people who are on the military academies. And you just made a line that said, well, gee, you know, the FTC commissioners can't be fired. Do you think it'll go that far where the president, I mean, that's just this new wrinkle that just hit me as you were sort of talking about that. I was wondering if you have any thoughts about president's not liking what he's doing. Fine, I fire you commissioner under this new precedent that he thinks that he has. Um, so I don't think that that's how it will be used. Um, I, I think that, you know, the, the president you know, the, the FTC by organic statute can have more than three commissioners from the same political party. So if he fired the two Republican commissioners, he would still have to, he couldn't put Democrats in to, to take their place. Uh, but w one direction I do think it's going is the idea that under SELA law, you might get a challenge to finally say the leadership of the FTC has to be removable at will. And then perhaps that would raise that issue. Right. So it's a kind of a one step to remove thing that are we going to change the character because the agency is acting in a different way. It's no longer engaging in kind of case by case enforcement, which is sort of why it was always carved out of Humphrey's the Humphrey's executor decision and now is moving towards promulgating legislative like rules. Therefore, shouldn't it be. You know, we've got the dele non delegation problem, but also shouldn't there be, um, you know, uh, agency leadership that's removable at will, and then you kind of end up, I think, in the scenario you're talking about, where when you have a new administration, you could have a wholesale change at the FTC, which, of course, it wasn't, it was created to have continuity and bipartisan kind of expert expertise applied. Commissioners have seven year terms to specifically go beyond any individual um, administration. So I think it could change the character of the agency quite quite a bit and it's the result of the actions that they're taking it's not it's not inevitable that that would have to happen so just a quick follow-up um and, and we've known each other for years i mean one of the things i'm finding fascinating i, I would really like to have your your insights on this is that for years and admittedly i come out of the telecom space you know for those people who have been under the yoke of abusive regulation the argument has always been Oh, you know, we'll get it over to the FTC. They're dispassionate. They're case specific. They're non political. And I would submit the developments over the last couple months that argument has just now gone right out the window. Um, and the agency is now moving towards almost an, an Uber regulator. Um, how do you see this all playing out? Um, I've seen the argument being made that Section 5. It's not really antitrust. That's only the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act. It's something different. Um, as an institutionalist of the FTC who's, who's been there for years, where do you think this is all going? Are we going now? Will this effect be the now national, the, the reemergence of the national nanny? Are they really going to do, as far as what I can tell, they haven't been, they claim they're following the APA. That's kind of squishy. Um, and then still, if as an enforcement agency, and I realize they're trying to now do rulemakings, but you know, anybody's involved in any major rulemaking at any administrative agency, a highly political one, I should say, or even an adjudication of a merger, you get what I call collectivism. And I've read you know, just thousands and thousands of auto generated. Is, is the FTC even, are they even thinking that that's where it's gonna go? Because that whole political apparatus is just gonna go right over to Independence Avenue now. So your thoughts on that, please. Uh, well, what, one of the things that happened at the FTC's open meeting today is that uh, they are putting into place some kind of process, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't get to watch the whole open meeting because I was driving here, but um, to have um, essentially petitions from third parties um, be not just published on the FTC website, which is already the case, but I believe you know have to be considered by be considered by the FTC and Commissioner Wilson made a remark, at least according to Twitter reports of her remarks, <laughs> that um, this will just create like a petition machine, right? And so you know just kind of this drive again towards regulation and rulemaking and away from historic case by case 
enforcement. So that, and they've created a rulemaking division in the Office of the General Counsel, and they've changed um, uh, procedural rules to streamline rulemaking. So I, all, all signs point to lots of rulemaking, is what I would say. Sir. You'd wait for the mic so that our... Uh, former uh, Acting Chair Olhausen made uh, reference to uh, unfair methods of competition rules, but could, might the FTC uh, attempt to Magnuson Moss unfair acts rule, for example, in labor, in labor area, to go after labor markets? Because arguably that type of rulemaking is more defined, uh, has its complexities, but it has, it's, it's much better established in unfair methods of competition. So in effect, through the back door, going after competition problems under Magnus and Moss. Sure, I think, I think that, that could be one option. It takes away the argument that Congress didn't give them the rulemaking authority, because Congress very clearly did uh, in the Magnus and Moss Act, give them unfair and deceptive. Now there are, you know, additional requirements of prevalence and you know some of the other issues that they standards they need to meet to promulgate a, a udap rule unfair and deceptive acts or practices rule um or we could see some kind of combined rule which is what they did back in the day <laughs> in the petroleum refiners case so i think uh you know we, we may see several flavors and they'll they might see what which one works out best other questions Sir, could you, could, could you just hold on until we get a mic so that our remote audience can hear you as well? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think part of the fundamental problem in using antitrust and Article Three solutions is that the market itself isn't really understood because you have companies like IBM where you know, they produced the uh, uh, mainframes and they really were the only one in the market and they produced a product what the, the problem here is that the market, the user, um, is, is not the consumer. The, the, the user is, is, is the raw material that Google is, is using to produce the final product. So you have a user, you have Google, who is a consumer of that user. And then you have advertising companies and data aggregation that's a consumer of Google. So the people that are paying the bills and keeping the lights on at Google are not the users, they're, they're basically the people that are paying for Google's services. So without legislation, Article I solutions to fix the user problem and the exploitation of the, the raw material and the resource, which is the user, I, I don't see how any other solution would work because what Google is doing is they're actually mining all of this, this intelligence out of all of these communities and monetizing it and, and as you can see, like, like these companies are, are making billions of dollars off of, you know, on the backs of the users. So maybe putting some of that user uh, uh, money back into the communities that they're pulling it out of, maybe that be one part of the solution. But I, I, I mean, unless you can see another way of applying antitrust, because the consumer, again, is not, uh, is not the user. You're trying to protect the user, but the user is not the consumer. Anyone want to react to that, Darren? I think you can have multiple users, you have multiple consumers, and quite honestly, if there's not value for the, I guess you're talking about the person doing the Google searches as being the user. If they don't find the Google to be of value, then they're not gonna get these other businesses along the way and the ad revenue or whatever, so ultimately they're, they are benefiting the consumer. The consumers are getting all kinds of benefits for it, I mean, if we look at all the things that the end user's getting, that's great. There's nothing new about providing all kinds of data to private firms and then firms aggregating data and matching it up. So I don't really know what's particularly unique in that sense. And if we're concerned about a privacy issue and, and a data-specific type of issue, then as Mark was talking about, we would to have a specific discussion on those narrow issues, not necessarily antitrust. So I'm not... Sure, what, and I, I, never, I hear people talk about it, that Google's, you know, making money off the back of the consumer, but that presumes that we're not getting anything out of using Google. I mean, the truth is people use Google for a reason. Um, they have other choices. They can go to other choices, but they do use 
Google, and there's all kinds of benefits. Free, granted, we do give data to them. Um, and apparently we like the search results and the ease of its use. So I'm not sure what the, why, what the issue is and what is the anti-competitive conduct at issue here? What is the, the bad action that, that's at play? So, I mean, we have all kinds of different issues we have to think about with antitrust, you know. Um, is there monopoly power? Um, and that's just not, specifically we have to answer um, not just market share questions, because that's not what monopoly power is by itself. It's market, it's uh, market share within the relevant market, and do they have actual, can they sustain the monopoly prices? And then you gotta combine that with then the bad action. But I'm not sure we need to identify what that specific action is. Then it's easier, I think, for me at least, to respond to a, you know, whether or not antitrust is appropriate. We use Article Three solutions for for unconscionable contracts where one party has no no bargaining power against the other. It's, it's the same as Google, or even for that matter, Facebook, where people try to get their views out, but there's no way of getting the views out once they limit them or suppress them. So, so we use laws to fix those issues. Um, I don't, you know, I don't see how, I, I don't know whether it's necessarily antitrust, but, but we do use the power of the courts to fix those solutions. We do use legislation to fix those solutions. It, I don't see why Google would be If the terms different. of agreement could be compared to an unconscionable contract, which I'm not sure they can be, that would maybe be a, a way of going about doing it, but I don't think, it, I don't think that we would compare it that way. I don't know what my colleagues think, but I don't, I mean, that is a way of looking, I mean, it's a possible way of looking at it, but I don't think it would, of course, are reluctant to do that anyway, but even if they did, I don't see it necessarily the, the agreement between the users and Google being kind of that kind of unconscionable type of contract where they're, well, I'll look at it there. Me, we have about five minutes left, so let me ask. Sure. I'll sing a few bars of something while. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is for all members of the panel. Um, most people in this room, I, I know, don't like the Democratic proposals for uh, legislative uh, uh, changes to antitrust law. I'm wondering if any of you um, have Republican proposals that you like or your own proposals that you'd you know, like to, in an ideal world, see enacted, or I guess third choice is just think we should you know, basically leave it to uh, the courts and not have any legislative fixes. That's a great concluding question. So let's, um, so, I think so, we have a minute yeah. each. Maybe. Great, so, so let me jump in. I have been very supportive of the antitrust agencies getting more resources to do the case-by-case -case antitrust enforcement that's economically based. You need skilled antitrustlers and you need economists and you need economic experts. Uh, and those are costly. And I think it, but that doesn't mean, you know, therefore we should throw over the whole system and make the standards different. Why don't we give the agencies more funding to do more of the traditional case-by-case, -case, economically driven antitrust analysis? So bills that would give the agencies more money have my support. Yeah, um, oh, sorry. No, no, no. <clears throat> One of the other interesting things from the research that my colleagues and I did when we looked at factors that influenced um, output of antitrust enforcement, the one variable we found that was significant was agency budgets. Not shocking, but it wouldn't necessarily be true. It turns out um, that at least in the data set we looked at over a period of time, it was quite extensive, that that, 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 was, that, was, the, that was what we found. Now, I don't know if we need more antitrust or not, but if the problem is seen as, well, antitrust is basically doing an okay job, but there's not enough of it, I think that's, that's probably the thing that I, would, that I would do. And to the gentleman's point about Google, I mean, if nothing else, one can say it's, it's complicated, and to sort out what to do about a Google, you want some good, rigorous work done by people who are resourced to do it. They're not going to get very far if they don't, aren't resourced to go in and get data and look at it in very large quantities 
um, and, and do a serious um, analysis. And that does cost money. So if, if the goal is to do more uh, along the lines of the way the law is currently structured, then I think you know, agency budgets are probably the way to go. John? I'm not sure if I brought this up in my remarks or not. Um, but I, I don't know, it's kind of, I think when we get, maybe I did, when you get big government solutions, like when we go, when people are interested in free markets and economic freedom, we go up to the hill and we talk to staffers and we try to identify, kind of say, hey, this big government solution is not a, a good idea, then the often response is, okay, what big government solution do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the problems of being somebody who actually believes in free markets. It's tough to give them. So I think it's really important, again, for us not to respond to big government solutions by then, okay, we better come up with our smaller big government solution. I don't know what, I mean, again, we need to identify what problem we're trying to address. If there's a concern, and I have heard a concern, whether or not the consumer welfare standard really does address non-price types of issues. If that's a concern, that's something that if we need to codify that, fine, that might be something worth doing. I know one piece of legislation would try to codify the consumer welfare standard. I don't know if that, it's not gonna get very far, but if you did that, you would have to compromise on some really bad things um, as well. So I don't, and again, I, I just think it's important to try, I'm trying to, I don't know if I'm doing very well, but try to reframe a lot of this to, if we're concerned about making sure that people have the opportunity to engage in voluntary um, transactions and to be able to start businesses and to choose their career paths and to be able to compete effectively without the government meddling and others meddling or, and quite honestly, um, for private firms actually violating, like doing, being involved in price fixing or whatever, there are actions that can be taken, should be taken, but we, what we need to be doing is focusing again on how um, the government itself does create problems. And it does create a lot of problems, so why not, that's not a bad place to start, I think. Well, that was a, a great wide-ranging panel. We did everything from tailored men's and boys' clothing to persnickety <laughs> separation of powers analysis. So um, I, will you all join me in giving a hand to our three panelists? <laughs>